Dr. Miyuski is the director and distinguished professor at the Climate Change Institute right here at our very own University of Maine. Over four decades, he has led more than 50 major expeditions to Antarctica, Greenland, the Himalayas, and the Andes. Served as the lead investigator for several multi-institutional and international research efforts in Greenland, Antarctica, and Asia. He has published more than 350 peer-reviewed articles, is the recipient of numerous awards, including the first internationally awarded Medal for Excellence in Antarctic Research. He appears regularly in high-profile media, such as 60 Minutes, PBS show Fresh Air, and is the author of popular books. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say it is a pleasure to have what I think most would agree is the most prominent, imminent, eminent <laughs> expert in the field of climate change, Dr. Miyuski. And imminently I'm here. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, actually, before we, we start, I would like to thank you for everything that you do. Uh, your profession is extremely important, and one can only imagine what the world would look like if you didn't do what you do. So, thank you, and thank you for coming to listen to the presentation. Uh, you'll, what you see in front of you are, uh, is a weather map uh, from a typical day this last winter. And the most obvious thing to all of us, of course, is the fact that eastern North America was extremely cold, unusually cold. Uh, and I live in Brooklyn, and in the little town store, I remember hearing people talk about the fact that this must mean, of course, that the climate is not warming, that climate change is, is not real, uh, and this is probably a fairly typical perception. But in fact, if you look at this map carefully, what you see any day in the last few months is the fact that the East Coast has been extremely cold, very, very unstable. The Arctic has been warmer than it has been in a long, long time. I'll tell you how long that's been. Uh, and North America, I'm sorry, the Roman Hemisphere has also been extremely warm. So we have a very unique situation. And you ask, one asks oneself, how long will this last? Uh, is it a, a one-off event? Will more years be like this in the future? Uh, what can we expect? In order to answer these questions, our institute, which is one of the oldest climate institutes in the world, uh, basically looks at not just what we have for weather records, which believe it or not, really only go back about 50 years, uh, but we also collect various other sorts of records that allow us to go back years, hundreds, thousands, many thousands of years, because the way the climate operates as of the last 30 to 50 years is not necessarily the way it's always operated, and you need to understand that. Uh, for future prediction, and that in fact is our primary goal, is coming up with better predictions for how the climate uh, will operate in the future. Uh, because whether that climate is going to be warmer and or stormier, or all of those things, where drought occurs, and no matter how dismal some of these predictions may be, it's really critical for us to understand what might happen in order to take advantage and to do the things that we need to do to prepare ourselves, and even more importantly, to have opportunities for the future. So we collect ice cores all over the world, uh, and from these ice cores, we can reconstruct past temperature, precipitation, atmospheric circulation patterns, chemistry of the atmosphere, sea ice extent, on literally a season-by-season -season basis. And one of the things that we've learned, if you look at just the last 5,000 years, Although, uh, if, if I made this chart as long as it should be, it would go back about a million years, but you wouldn't notice what happened in the last 150 years. But let's just take the last 5,000 years. We live in an absolutely unique time period. Uh, not just greenhouse gases are higher than they have uh, been in at least millions of years, uh, but we have more toxic substances, as we understood from John Warner's wonderful presentation. We have increased levels of radioactivity, particulates which affect our, our health, on and on and on. Uh, we live in an absolutely unique time and we really wonder how in fact as a species we're going to evolve. Uh, some of us obviously will adjust to it, some of us won't. The idea that the climate might warm as a consequence of uh, human activities has, has been known for a long time. There were predictions back in the 1970s 
uh, using climate models, which were very crude at the time, uh, that suggested that the climate would warm globally, which is really an oversimplification, as you'll see in a minute, uh, but that the climate would warm as a consequence of the rise of greenhouse gases. And this, is, this has been known for a long time based, uh, based on uh, the physics and chemistry of, of the system. Uh, what's remarkable about these predictions uh, are two things. Uh, in the plot that you see shows what was predicted for the future in the mid-1970s. Uh, they, they got all the trends right for CO2, for temperature, everything else. Uh, however, the only thing that they got two things wrong. Uh, one of them was the fact that they underpredicted the impact of greenhouse gas warming even though it has only started. And number two, they assumed that the change would be a linear change. And this brings up a very interesting point. Almost all models, and this is a consequence of the way models have to be generated, assume that change will be linear. But in fact, it doesn't have to be linear. And as I'll show you in a moment, uh, we know that the climate just does not change in a nice, gradual way. Uh, it can sometimes change in, in one jump, or, as suggested in the cartoon up here, you can have a series of jumps. And once that jump occurs, you might stay at that level for a while, it might dip back down again, uh, but the way that the natural system adjusts, even to humanly forced uh, controls on the climate system, is not necessarily linear. Uh, the classic example is the melting of the Arctic summer sea ice. The expectation was that it would take until 2040 to 2060 for summer sea ice to be done in the Arctic. It happened a few years ago. It happened much faster than the models predicted. So why do we think that the climate doesn't operate linearly? Um, in this diagram on the upper right, upper left as you face it, uh, you'll see a plot in red that shows the last 100,000 years of, of temperature change for the northern hemisphere or for the world. And the important message here is that it Remember, this is 100,000 years. It shows very, very gradual change. It does show a very big upturn about 10,000 years ago when the ice sheets started to melt, but it's a very gradual change. And until the early 1990s, this is what everybody in the scientific community believed was the case, that climate changed slowly. And what's the big take home message from climate changing slowly? It means that no matter what you put into the atmosphere, you could not possibly uh, produce an effect. <clears throat> Turns out that that's not the way the climate system operates. And we learned uh, in a program that we had in Greenland that allowed us to go back year by year, 100,000 years, the first time that had ever been done, it's now being repeated in other parts of the world, that the climate system can change very, very quickly. In fact, it can go from one uh, state to another, in meaning changes of one or two degrees centigrade in the last few thousand years, or even much, much more, in less than a year or two. So the climate can operate faster than a political cycle. Unbelievable, uh, when you really think about it. Uh, and along with changes in temperature that can operate that fast and, and be sustained for many hundreds of years after that, before the next big change, you can also get dramatic changes in precipitation, and you can get dramatic changes uh, in winds, the strength of winds and the position of winds. This next plot shows you the way the westerlies, the winds that come from uh, the western part of the United States and blow right into Maine, how they vary on a daily basis. And one of the things that we discovered was that the position of these winds, and I'll go back one second to the previous, uh, the position of these winds uh, the, front, the frontal end of these is called the jet stream, and the jet stream during the winter is much farther south, as you see from the figure in the upper right, and, uh, and then in the, in the summer, it moves farther north. These abrupt climate change events are situations in which the jet stream gets locked into one situation or another for some number of years. It doesn't necessarily have to be full summer conditions, but it's a change. And as this shift occurs, Parts of the planet are left with water, with certain temperatures, because it's the wind, as we all know, that actually transports any heat that's around and the, and the ocean, uh, and it also transports moisture. So one of the reasons that Syria is in so much turmoil today, one of the underpinnings for this is the fact that Syria has experienced a drought for several decades. 
and as a consequence, the economy has been drastically altered in Syria. If we take a look at the last 10,000 years and how many abrupt climate change events have occurred, you can see that there are some very rapid uh, jumps up and down. This is actually a plot of the extent of sea ice in the North Atlantic, something that we can measure with our ice cores. Uh, as it turns out, obviously, when there are sea ice is farther and farther north or smaller, that means summer conditions prevail longer uh, over the year, and vice versa, when there is more sea ice, that means colder conditions. And if you take a look at two prominent periods in the last 10,000 years, one of them is 4,200 years ago, when the sea ice was very, very minimal uh, compared to the general 10,000 years, and another one was about 900 AD. And these are both time periods when there was very, very dramatic change in civilization. In the case of 4,200 years ago, the drought impacted modern-day Syria, modern-day Iraq, all the way into eastern China, because the jet stream that normally was delivering moisture to these areas moved much farther north, and the winds didn't bring uh, precipitation. If you take a look at the climate model predictions for the future that are done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they identify several areas of drought, and the two that I've circled are exactly the same places. One, uh, Central America, the collapse of the Mayan Empire, uh, and the other one, 4,200 years ago, the collapse of what was then called the Mesopotamian Empire, modern-day Syria, uh, and eastward. So one of the things that we've done with these records is to be able to demonstrate what will happen under uh, potentially drier conditions. If you take a look at the opposite situation, a time when sea ice was very, very uh, extensive, uh, we went as a, as a hemisphere in about AD 1400, within about 10 years, we went from having Arctic sea ice that was not very extensive to Arctic sea ice that was very extensive. Uh, prior to that period, Greenland was colonized by uh, Leif Erikson, uh, and then all of a sudden, AD 1400 to 1410, the Norse disappeared from Greenland. They starved to death. They were no longer uh, resupplied. And that was the beginning of a time period called the Little Ice Age. And that period is important to us now because it's the underpinning for the natural climate that we would be experiencing if it weren't for warming. There is no doubt at all that our climate would have stayed rather cold, probably for another few hundred years. So the first thing you might be thinking is that, oh, greenhouse gas warming is fantastic. It took us out of, out of the Little Ice Age a uh, hundred years ago or so. But it's not that simple. If the natural climate system wants to be cold, and we're making it warm, as we all know, the very worst thing is to have very warm and very cold air collide. It creates tremendous instabilities in the climate system. So, what causes abrupt climate change, and do we have anything to do with it? This picture in the upper left shows you the drill system that we put together. It took five years and 25 universities to develop this system. The lower left just shows you a bunch of patterns. Every one of those patterns is a thing that composes the climate system, and on the right side, the little cartoons are the things that control climate. Everyone that has a star on it is able to either by itself, depending on how fast it changes, or in concert with the other things with stars on it, actually change, uh, create a, an abrupt change. One in less than one to two years, less than uh, 10 to 20 years. Uh, and I'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. The only one that actually of the major climate forcings that can't create abrupt climate change is the one with little planets on it, uh, because the way the Earth receives uh, sun or uh, uh, heat from the sun, uh, op that those cycles operate on very very long periods, tens of thousands of years. So let's look at the thing that has changed, that forces climate, greenhouse gases, that uh, that in the past was very likely the thing that maintained climate, but we've done something very different to greenhouse gases. Uh, by comparison with the last 800,000 years, for which we understand the levels of greenhouse gases extremely well, we know that they, that they shifted between about 180 and 200 and 
80 parts per million per volume. Uh, and we know that today we're up at 400. We know that the predictions for the future are, must, are much higher. So the, the magnitude, without a doubt, has exceeded anything from the last 800,000 years, if not much, much longer. But what's more important is that the rate of increase is on the order of about 100 times faster than anything observed in the record for the last 800,000 years or so. So this makes uh, abrupt climate change a very, very important potential, uh, sorry, a uh, greenhouse gas rise, a very, very important uh, uh, agent that can lead to fast, fast changes in the climate system, which is why I've circled, circled that star for greenhouse gases, CO2, methane. The other thing that also impacts uh, the climate system are dusts in the atmosphere. And in addition to dust, aerosols, things like black carbon uh, emissions, m much of what you are extremely familiar with. And these can either cool or warm the climate. They can be dramatically altered on local to regional scales by human activity. And when you take uh, these two things and put them together and take the heating and cooling effects, if they're localized, you can actually change ocean circulation uh, by, for example, melting glaciers and putting cold water into the North Atlantic, which slows, which speeds up uh, and can also slow uh, ocean circulation and transport of heat. Uh, you can lead to it can lead to massive decay of ice uh, along the edges of large ice sheets like Antarctica, which has already happened. And all of these things, in turn, tend to change ocean circulation and atmospheric circulation. In addition, if you go to the southern hemisphere, not so much the northern hemisphere, uh, but one of the things that is a natural climate forcer is the energy or changes in energy output of the sun on the order of the solar cycle, 10, 11 years, uh, on, and, and much, much longer uh, patterns and cycles. Well, as it turns out, in, in the Antarctic, as a consequence of the emission of chlorofluorocarbons, uh, and less so to the Arctic, we have a massive ozone hole. A loss of ozone is destroyed by chlorofluorocarbons and actually many other things that are trapped in the Antarctic atmosphere during the winter. And then once the light comes on uh, in Antarctica, it creates a series of chain reactions that destroy the ozone. And that ozone protects the upper atmosphere, uh, trapping heat at higher levels. All of a sudden, that heat is transported to different places. So let's take a look at what the interaction of all of these things has been uh, over the last roughly 10 or 12 years compared to the previous roughly 20 years. I choose this 30, roughly 30-year, 30 40-year time period because, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is the time period for which we have the very best understanding of how temperature, precipitation, atmospheric circulation, sea ice extent, everything else has changed. And what you see is we haven't quite, in fact, we're far from achieving global warming at this stage. doesn't mean that we won't uh, in the next few decades. But the regions that have been hit the most are, of course, the high Arctic, uh, some of the edge regions of the, uh, of the Antarctic, and some of the high mountain regions and the interiors of continents. But in particular, uh, the high Arctic and the subarctic. And if you take a look at what this actually translates into for the high Arctic, in the last five years, uh, or six years, it turns out that the warming uh, of the Arctic, which of course has led to opening up of much of the Arctic Ocean, which releases heat, changes the color of the surface of the ocean, which means it can absorb uh, more heat and, and therefore release more heat. Uh, the Arctic Ocean, portions of the Arctic Ocean and the Arctic have warmed by as much as 9 degrees centigrade in the last 5 to 6 years. 9 degrees centigrade is huge. It's about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that change occurred in less than 5 years, if you compare it to the previous 30 years. Uh, and if you take a look at how this compares to warming in the past, the last time we had a warming that was that large was close to 12,000 years ago when ice sheets over the northern hemisphere started to melt. The big difference is that that warming was distributed much more widely over the northern hemisphere as opposed to the recent one, which is actually just a precursor of the future uh, for warming uh, in, a, in a much more local area. So what happens when you warm the Arctic that much 
in five years. Does that have anything to do with Maine and why in the world is the Climate Change Institute spending any of its time working outside of Maine in order to understand the climate system? Here's the answer. If you take a look at the distribution of winds, these are the westerly winds that I showed you before that go from California and make their way into Maine and wrap all the way around the northern hemisphere. If you take a look at the change in the winds for roughly the last few years prior to uh, compared to previous couple of decades, what you find out is that the strength of those westerly winds has weakened about 10 to 20 percent on average. And that may not sound like a lot, but it's a very big deal. Uh, and if you take a look at the effect of this weakening, uh, it looks like this. If you, on the left hand side, you see uh, at the very top, this blue area that says warmer, that's the warm Arctic. So the relative change in the Arctic is that it's gotten warmer. If you come down to the reddish area uh, between uh, the Arctic and the equ equatorial latitudes, that's warmed a little bit, not a lot, but warmed a little bit as a consequence of greenhouse gas warming. That tremendous imbalance uh, compared to what existed before means that the temperature gradient between the poles and the equator has now flattened out. Everything has actually gotten warmer. And when you flatten out the temperature gradient, the net effect on the meteorology is that the winds that go from west to east weaken. So that blue uh, arrow that's wrapping around, that actually those winds weaken. When you weaken the westerly winds, it means that the exchange of air between the poles and the equator can become tremendously elevated. So you can get very large cold air masses pushing much farther south than they normally would, and warm air masses pushing much farther north. And there isn't a strong westerly barrier that can actually prevent this from happening. The world that we're used to, in general, in our lifetimes is a, time, is a time when the westerly winds create this nice strong barrier and the cold air stays in Canada and North and Maine and it's warm everywhere else. Sure, there are changes. So if we take a look at the new situation in the last five years, what's basically happened is the blue, which is the westerly winds have weakened, the red, which is the exchange between temperatures from the north to the south, south to the north, has intensified, and that tends to create at the edge of the jet stream not a west-east pattern, but this very, very embayed pattern. And this very embayed pattern means that cold air can push its way down much farther south in parts of the northern hemisphere because of where the Arctic is warmed, uh, because of the geography of North America, that cold air for right now is coming, or for the last winter, uh, came our way. The longer, the, the more these waves are embayed from north to south, one more thing happens. Those waves, typically when they're very, very horizontal, uh, those waves travel through quickly. The more embayed they are, the more those waves slow down. So we get locked in these patterns. Does that mean that we're going to have this pattern every single year for the rest of, uh, of the Century? No, not necessarily, but it does mean that the likelihood for instabilities in the climate system uh, is very, very great until the climate system eventually equilibrates uh, to the levels that are basically imparted by things like greenhouse gases, dust in the atmosphere, etc. So it's this shape of the jet stream, and of course it, the impacts on the ocean, which operate a little bit more slowly, which have resulted in the tremendous extremes in weather that we've had since about 2012, and arguably even farther back uh, in time. And it's not the climate that we really care about, it's the weather that we care about. That's what present, prevents you from flying to a meeting, it's what prevents you uh, from getting to work, it's what creates drought, et cetera, et cetera. And there have been extremes all over the world, and particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, and on extremes in the Southern Hemisphere too, for example, Australia, uh, because the jet stream that surrounds the Antarctic that normally brings moisture to Australia has moved farther south. There are places as close to the equator as Mali, which has been in a lot of political turmoil lately, that have lost uh, moisture similar to, and, and have been uh, thrown into drought similar to what's happened uh, in Syria. The cost of these things is tremendous. This is a plot by uh, Munich Re, 
Uh, Munich Re and Swiss Re are two reinsurance companies. They're the ones that insure all the insurance companies. Uh, so they have the biggest amount of money to throw around. And, uh, and all that they really care about, uh, I've been involved in several uh, presentations for them, what they really care about is where will storms hit, how fast will they hit, and knowing exactly, uh, exactly where they'll hit. Uh, because they gamble as that storm begins to get closer and closer to populated areas on how much insurance. And then, of course, the net result is uh, that our insurance rates are changed. So rate of change is very, very important. Let's go to one other very big example of rate of change, and that's sea level, something that isn't going to affect us in the next 10 years, but might have a very dramatic effect in the next 20 uh, to 30 to 50 years. And this is a... Uh, a picture from the movie uh, The Day After Tomorrow, when of course the ocean rises and uh, uh, falls, whatever storms occur. Hollywood actually figured out abrupt climate change about three or four years after we discovered it and, and made a lot of money on it, unlike us. Uh, so what sort of estimates do we have for future sea level rise? This is very, very big. Obviously, those of you who live in coastal communities, it's important. Anybody who's involved with uh, sewage, uh, any sort of conduits, it's going to change the, uh, the hydrologic uh, gradient across the entire state of Maine, much less other areas, and, uh, and end up with the loss of tremendous areas, all of which are largely populated, including many islands. So um, what's the projection for 2100? And is 2100, which is what everybody talks about, uh, is that the right thing to be thinking about? Well, here are a range of projections for 2100. If you take a look at the first two blue bars on the left, uh, this is the most recent projection that came out of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And the projections for 2100 range from 23 centimeters, it's not very much, up to almost a meter. This is actually a downgrade from what they said earlier. Uh, those of us in the glaciological community, those of us who study ice in various ways, uh, came up with a prediction in 2009, which was significantly more, uh, on the order of about 1.3 meters. And you can go to any website, or there are plenty of websites around, and see what one meter, two meters, etc., will mean to coastal communities. However, if you take a look at what the projected, even conservative, temperature range is uh, for 2100. You, if you go over to the right, uh, that's a plot that goes back about 80 million years. And the last time the temperature was 2 degrees centigrade warmer than it is today over a large part of the Earth was 130,000 years ago. And when that temperature raised 2 degrees centigrade, sea level rose 4 to 6 meters. And the last time the temperature was 3 degrees centigrade, which is still easily within the realm of possibility by 2100, or much faster if the system operates more abruptly, uh, sea level rose almost 20 meters. Uh, and that was several million years ago. So we're clearly uh, going into a period in which we could expect very, very dramatic change. The next question, of course, is, OK, fine. Sea level might be 4 to 6 meters higher uh, by 2500. Who knows? How fast can, in fact, sea level rise? And this is a plot that shows you how fast temperature can rise. This is a particularly prominent event that occurred about 14,000 years ago. Uh, it is believed that sections of Antarctica, which are melting today, uh, actually melted at this time. Portions of the edge of Greenland, which are melting today, melted at, at that time. And the rise was as much as 20 meters in 500 years. That translates to 13 feet in 100 years. So we have, if nature is correct and the record is correct, we should expect from even a 2 degree centigrade rise, uh, sea level to, a sea level rise of close to 4 meters. And maybe it won't be to 2,500, but the potential is that it could be there much, much faster. This is critical for planning, for how you build, uh, where you put cities. Uh, whether, in fact, you even want to put cities in certain places and, and how, you, how high you build seawalls. If you're going to build a seawall, you want to build it that, in a place and in a way that it will last at least several hundred years. So, a couple of concluding remarks. Um, this is uh, something that's become popular with the Pentagon, who are really on board with abrupt climate change. 
uh, and the White House now, and many, many other governments. Uh, it's something that we've been saying for a long time, and it's really gratifying to see uh, large governmental organizations saying this climate change is a major security issue. It impacts our health through changes in the distribution of ticks, uh, pollutants in the atmosphere. It impacts our, our economy, and you know a large part about that. Uh, catastrophes, we have more extreme events, and will have proportionally more extreme events in the future. And also geopolitics, just look at what's going on in modern day Syria, the underpinning, not the only reason, uh, and all of the fighting that's going, not fighting hand to hand, but political fighting that's going on in the Arctic as a consequence of the opening up of CIS. So for some concluding remarks, um, there's no doubt at all that humans have had a dramatic impact on the climate system. Uh, climate can change far more abruptly uh, than we ever thought before. Uh, it is the redistribution of winds and ocean currents uh, that actually deliver changes in moisture and changes in temperature to the places we live. The physics of the planet has not changed one bit since things started. Uh, so we look for the winds to transport the winds, uh, things to us. We need to think about whether or not we're creating plausible scenarios. Uh, are we really thinking about all of the things that can change and how fast they can change, right down to the community level? And should we think, be thinking only about what might happen in 2100, or should we pay attention to the fact that what's happened in the last five years in the Arctic was not supposed to happen until 2040 to 2060. So my belief is that if we understand where we're going, we can make, uh, we can have better opportunities for ourselves in the future. And on October 23rd, uh, our institute at the University of Maine will be running a workshop. You can watch it on the web, you can attend. Uh, it's called Climate Adaptation and Sustainability uh, Planning. And we will demonstrate uh, some software that is available to all of you. You can go up to the website right now, but it'll be greatly updated and expanded that allows you to see how the physical climate system has changed and how our chemical climate system has changed. And we will also update a, a document that we produced at the uh, request of Governor Baldacci in 2009 called Maine's Climate Future. It's been five years, and we're going to update, update that uh, and make that available on October 23rd. Thank you very much.